So, Pauline, real, real. Can you tell us just a little bit more? I think we get the concept. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your key priorities are? Sure. One thing that I found out today that I hadn't anticipated is that there was a question as to whether it was real or real. Um, <laughs> and I hadn't actually thought about this, but actually it could be either, because real, as a football team, the, what we are about is not just me, obviously, it's a centre and it's a group of people who are committed to looking at education um, and international development in some of the poorest countries in the world, particularly in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So I can see a cluster of colleagues there who hopefully, when we're mingling over a glass of wine, everyone will get to meet and discuss further. I think, so that's the first thing. I would say it's real rather than real, but there is a reason why it could be either. The real centre, as we've been hearing, is about, I would say it's got three words that I was associated with it. Rigour, partnership and impact. So I'll say a little bit about each of those. But I'm going to start with impact. Now, as you heard earlier, some of us had the privilege this morning of meeting the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. And one of the things she said was that when she was speaking to her daughters and they were using technology, using social media, she said, them, rather than using social media for the purposes of saying what you've had for your school lunch, use it for the purposes of saying what you've learnt in the classroom. So I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact we have a hashtag here, Real CamFed, and part of impact is actually about getting messages out to a wider world. So in this context, in this environment where we have such wonderful speakers, hopefully using social media to help get that message out. That's obviously not the only aspect of, of impact, but that's one. I also wanted to just say that obviously the Real Centre has a history, it hasn't come from nowhere. So there has been a lot of work already going on within the education faculty in relation to education and international development. When I joined, there were two centres that were actively working on education in developing countries. One that was primarily associated with the RECOPE programme, which was a large DFID-funded programme looking at research on educational outcomes. And the other looking at um, the Centre for Commonwealth Education, focusing primarily on Commonwealth countries. So we have a history and already a lot of work that's going on. But through sort of our further endeavours and looking together at where we wanted to go, we set priorities to bring together the work across these centres and further think about our priorities. And through that, we identified six themes, six research themes that we'll be focusing on. But cutting across all of those research themes are issues around inequality. Inequality primarily in relation to poverty, gender and disability. So the, those things that we've already been hearing so much about. And really, at the core of this is that you can't separate these three forms of disadvantage. They're intricately related. So the six themes include one on quality teachers and teaching. Um, we have a research program which, together with colleagues, we're going to be starting a large research project looking at the effectiveness of teaching in um, India and Pakistan in particular, and how to improve the quality of teachers to ensure effective learning outcomes for the most disadvantaged. We have a theme on digital technology and work that has been ongoing on open education resources for schools. We have a lot of work that's been going on in relation to leadership and professional development and work in particular in Ghana in relation to that. Work that we've been starting recently on higher education. We're hearing on the agenda now, higher education has been forgotten and that now we need to remember if we're going to have an educated workforce, we need to have a properly functioning higher education system. But too often in some of the poorest countries, that isn't the case. And even if there is a higher education system, the poorest aren't getting access to it. So we're looking at some of the issues around that. We're also looking at issues around conflict and peace. So again, there's been work that's been going on in the centre that we will be further developing in relation to how to ensure that those in the most disadvantaged parts of the world who are being denied an education have an education, but also how we can ensure that education systems themselves are promoting peace, and promoting peaceful societies, and that can even be in countries that we wouldn't consider as being in conflict. And finally, and perhaps cutting across all of these, are, uh, is, is the area of financing. So I have sort of various experience of work on financing and as part of the Oslo Summit on Education and Development have been working with a colleague in Pakistan, one of our partners in Pakistan, to look at the education financing um, there. So I think there's a range of different areas that our colleagues in the centre are building on. But really, 
we need to be more than some of our parts. So we want to bring this together, make sure that the research that we're doing is rigorous, but also to make sure that we're doing it in partnership. Because as researchers, we can only go so far. We need to work with partners who have experience both at the global level, so working a lot with the Department for International Development in various ways. Um, we also, this morning, in relation to the discussion with the First Lady, we're discussing how we might work further in partnership with the USAID, who has strong commitments to working in conflict areas as well as um, in relation to girls' education. We also, of course, want to work in partnership with NGOs who have experience on the ground, and this is where our partnership with CAMFED comes in in particular. And I think it's really, I mean, it's both fortuitous that we are all here in Cambridge, but I think there's real reasons why us working together makes sense. In my previous role in the Education for All Global Monitoring Report, we often grappled around to find good, strong evidence on what works in education. And we know that there's a lot of experience in NGOs, some of them quite small scale, some of them scattered and fragmented, but it was quite difficult to find evidence. And I have to say, one of the very few examples where we could find that there was both an evidence base, a commitment to actually ensuring that the work was based on evidence, but also that made sure that this was then done in a more systematic way, was CAMFED. Um, and so I think for us, actually working together with CAMFED to draw on their vast experience on the ground, on the fact that they have data, um, that they have already been sort of analysing, but actually identifying together what <coughs> areas we want to further look at um, in, in terms of really understanding the trajectories of girls' education and the transitions through Thanks to following. their lives. Thanks very much. Now, look, I'm conscious, like, I wouldn't mind asking you a couple of follow-up questions now, and I'm sure there's others in the audience who would be interested in exploring some of those themes. But for now, let's not. Let's just ho hold our thoughts for now, and we'll come back to those, because I want just if it's OK to ask a similarly introductory question to Lucy. You know, as, as uh, Pauline says, I mean, you're not a research organization, but you take research very seriously, and you have it baked into the heart of your program delivery. And I think, to be honest, that's one of the reasons why, you know, in terms of the the architecture around the girls' education challenge in relation to M&E and financial monitoring, etc. I think you're in really good shape, and that's one of the reasons. But what have you learned from that experience of taking research seriously in development, particularly in relation to, as we're, we're hearing in the earlier bits, the links between education and livelihoods in particular, which I know has been a key focus for you? Thanks, David. And I thought you were going to say that working with me was a challenge. <laughs> Which it is. Um, but yes, I, I think just picking up on something that Dr. Bratska said um, in your speech was that we have to be insistent about girls' right to education. And that is absolutely our starting point. But then going on from that, if we are going to achieve the full returns on the investment in girls' education, then we have to get right the link between girls' education and economic development. And that's something that we at CAMFED are working on and what our evidence base is moving towards. I know at the, at the recent G7 summit, um, they prioritized, and this was in the, the statement released from the summit, they prioritized women's entrepreneurship as the driver of innovation, jobs, and growth. And within that, their first stated priority was to make women aware of the possibility of entrepreneurship. And we would say that it's actually got to go a lot deeper than that. That in order for <coughs> young women to make that transition from school into economic opportunity, we have to look through their eyes in order to understand the barriers that they face and then dismantle those barriers. And that's when we will get the link between education and economic opportunity. And that's very much what we're about in CAMFED and what we've been working on over the past 20 years. Our programmes have literally grown up with the first co cohorts of girls supported through school. Um, Fiona here is representing that network. And the challenges that they've faced on the way through school and beyond. And they now, as a network of more than 33,000, are very much at the forefront as the experts on what, what works in that respect. And in our experience, one of the starting points is that the mere fact of girls' inclusion in the school system is important. 
the psychological impact of girls' exclusion when they're sitting at home and watching their brothers and their peers go to school can have a devastating impact on their sense of self-worth and make it far more difficult for them to access systems and services into the future. So that inclusion is absolutely critical. But what we're also seeing is that girls who, and this is you know, under the research we're doing under the Girls' Education Challenge, is that girls who are marginalised, who are in rural areas and from poor families, have, are very much challenged in the school environment in terms of their low levels of self-efficacy, self-awareness, that they're feeling isolated, feeling unable to participate in the classroom. And that, in turn, is having a knock-on effect on their ability to learn and to really be able to, to flourish in the school environment. And under the Girls' Education Challenge, we are tracking 21,000 young people, girls and boys, those who are marginalised and non-marginalised, in order to be able to dig down and look at some of the links between children's academic outcomes, the soft skills and the link between those, and these background variables. And that's something that we'll be digging into with the Real Centre. Lucy, and, yes. can, I, can I stop you there and just go to Fiona? Yes. Is that okay? I've got loads more yeah. to say, David. I know, but I, I, <laughs> I, I'm conscious of that, but I think some of that's going to come out of the, the Q&A, if it's okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Fiona, uh, your, your reputation is in relation to doing stuff with national governments, practical things on the ground in relation to gender-based violence, discrimination, etc., that really make a difference. And uh, I've seen that, I guess we've all, if we've been in the field, we've seen the impact of this. I was in Uganda recently and some of the girls were telling us about their journey to school, you know, their walk to school, that if they did it, it took two, two to three hours. And not only were they exhausted and dirty and hungry when they got to school, but they had the dodge various gangs of boys on the way. And it was just, there was a harrowing story that was told. But have you any, uh, specific things in relation to initiatives on the ground that you have found that have worked well in local contexts? Well, thank you very much, um, David. Uh, just to give also add to my um, introduction, I am he sitting here as a lawyer because of uh, the support that I got from, from Comfort. Um, Comfort supported me. Uh, when I was uh, 17 years old and uh, supported me to join law school in Zimbabwe and facing huge challenges coming from a very poor family. So some of the issues that you, you said that uh, when you went to Uganda, the girls were telling you I lived them myself and members of our Kaba network lived them and that is why when we came together to find the Kama network we wanted to really use our shared experiences of going to school in poor rural communities coming from very poor families to help other vulnerable girls to go through school and also to succeed after uh, after they they graduate and um, one of the issues that is really a major factor in terms of uh, affecting girls' education is the issue of uh, gender-based violence. You will find that you know, due to poverty, there is commodification of women. And women are an easy target. And when gender-based violence happen on women, it's, not, it's like they do not belong to themselves. They, our societies are patriarchal. Women belong to the men in their family, and when violence happens on them, it's commodified. It's the men negotiating with the perpetrators to say what can be done. Say, for example, a girl um, is sexually abused. The abuser will go to the father and say, I can, we can negotiate settlement. And they negotiate that the girl gets married to somebody who has been abusive to her and it becomes a vicious cycle of violence for that particular woman and, and, and it affects you know, that girl's education. And what we, we find that is that um, there may be laws and policies on paper that are very strong 
to protect girls' rights, but it is the attitudes on the grounds that we need to, to deal with. We need to deal with um, the attitudes of those gatekeepers who have an influence on a girl's life to make sure that they do not tolerate or accept violence when it happens on a woman. They do not negotiate. And we need to do a lot of work. Together with the members of our network, we are trying as much as possible to really educate communities about the effects of um, gender-based violence, especially on the education of girls. We are trying to negotiate with authorities. We are trying to engage the police. We are trying to engage in parliaments as well, so that at least people, it, it really goes down to changing mm -hmm. attitudes okay. at the ground level. Okay, mm -hmm. so thanks. And maybe, maybe if we have time, I would like to ask you later about some specific examples of, of that kind of thing that you've seen on the ground. Sure. But before we, we do that, I'm going to open it up to some questions from the floor.